morning, everybody. Good afternoon, rather. Welcome to the Commission Press Room for uh, our uh, meeting today, Tuesday, the 30th of August. Before we start with our normal media operations, I'm delighted to welcome, uh, for the first time in this academic uh, season, uh, Margarete Vestager, our Commissioner for Competition, who has an important announcement to make, and then we'll take questions, and then we switch back to media. Commissioner, welcome. You have the floor. Well, thank you very much. Uh, the European Commission uh, has today adopted a decision that uh, Apple's uh, tax benefits in Ireland are illegal. Two tax rulings uh, granted by Ireland have artificially reduced Apple's tax burden for over two decades in breach of EU state aid rules. Apple now have to repay the benefits worth up to 13 billion euros plus interest. This decision sends a clear message. Member states cannot give unfair tax benefits to selected companies. No matter if they are European or foreign, large or small, part of a group or not. This has been long confirmed by the EU courts and the Commission's case practice. EU state aid rules has been enforced since 1958 and apply to all companies that decide to operate in the EU single market. State aid rules ensure that companies can compete on equal terms, also as regards to taxation in each member state. And these rules protect European taxpayers. Today's decision concerns two companies in the Apple Group, Apple Sales International and Apple Operations Europe. Both are incorporated in Ireland and have been set up uh, by Apple to record profits there. Their ultimate parent is Apple Inc. in the US. The first company, Apple Sales International, accounts for almost all of the unpaid uh, taxes uh, Ireland now needs to recover. So how does this fit into the Apple Group? Apple Sales International holds the right to use Apple's intellectual poverty, property to sell and to manufacture Apple's products outside of North and South Af America. In exchange of these rights, it makes payments to Apple in the US to contribute to the development of this intellectual property, often more than two billion US dollars per year. In practice, Apple Sales International buys Apple products from their manufacturers. It sells these products throughout Europe, uh, as well as in the Middle East, in Africa, and in India. No matter if you buy your iPhone in Berlin or Rome or elsewhere in these regions, contractually, you buy it from Apple Sales International in Cork, in Ireland. This is how Apple decided to set it up. This means that uh, all profits coming from all these sales are recorded in Ireland. That arrangement, however, is, of, is not a matter for state aid rules, and we did not look into it as part of our investigation. Our state aid investigation focused on the allocation of profits recorded in Ireland within Apple Sales International. We looked into two tax rulings issued by Ireland to Apple, the first from 1991. It was replaced in 2007 by a similar second ruling. 
Both rulings endorsed an internal split of Apple sales international profits for tax purposes. They allocated the profit between each Irish branch and the company's head office, or I should say so-called head office, because this so-called head office only existed on paper. It has no employees, it has no premises, and it has no real activities. The Irish branch was subject to normal Irish corporate corporation tax. However, the head office was subject to no tax in Ireland or elsewhere. This was possible under Irish law, which until 2013 allowed for so-called stateless companies. As a result of the allocation method in the tax rulings, only a fraction of the profits uh, from the Apple sales uh, internationally were attributed to the Irish branch. The remaining, the vast majority of profits was attributed to the so-called head office. This means that Apple Sales International as a whole paid very little tax on its profits. Let me illustrate for one tax year. In 2011, Apple Sales International made a profit of 16 billion uh, euros. Less than 50 million euros were allocated to the Irish branch. The rest, the huge majority, was allocated to the so-called head office, where they remained untaxed. This means that Apple's effective tax rate in 2011 was 0.05%. To put that in perspective, it means that for every million euro in profits, it paid just 500 euros in taxes. This effective tax rate dropped further to as little as 0.005% in 2014, which means that even less was paid in taxes. It was 50 euros per million in profits. Our decision concludes that splitting the profits did not have any factual or economic justification. As mentioned, the so-called head office had no employees, no premises, no real activities. Only the Irish branch of Apple Sales International had any resources and facilities to sell Apple's products. But under the tax ruling, the so-called head office was attributed almost all of the company's profits. In fact, due to Apple's setup, it was attributed almost all of the profits made from App that profits that Apple made from selling products throughout Europe, the Middle East, Africa, and India. The second company, Apple Operations Europe, makes certain Apple computers in Ireland. Under the same two tax rulings, the majority of its profits was also artificially attributed to a so-called head office that only existed on paper and whose profits were not taxed. This selective tax treatment of Apple in Ireland is illegal under EU state aid rules. It gave Apple a significant benefit compared to other businesses. Tax rulings cannot endorse a methodology or a method to calculate taxable profits of a business that fails to react to reflect economic activity or the reality for that matter. So 
what are the consequences of this decision for Ireland and for Apple? To restore fair competition, Apple must recover up to 13 billion euros in unpaid taxes from Apple plus interest. This amount covers the period from 2003 until 2014. It starts 10 years before we made the first inquiries to the Irish authorities in 2013. It is for the Irish authorities to now determine the exact amount and the modalities of payment. The recovery amount can, for example, be put in an escrow account in case of an appeal in front of the EU courts. Also, Apple would no longer be allowed to benefit from this tax treatment in Ireland. The two tax rulings under investigation were, in any event, terminated last year by the company. It is up to the Irish authorities to ensure that the company, under its new setup, pays taxes in, li pays taxes in line with both Irish tax law and EU state aid rules. Finally, it may not be that all the unpaid taxes are due in Ireland. Apple Sales International are based, is based in Ireland, where it records all profits on sales of Apple products, as I said, throughout Europe, Africa, Middle East, and India. As I have already, men already mentioned, this recording of profits in itself is not a matter for state aid rules. It results from Apple's choice of structure. But other countries in the EU or elsewhere can look into our investigation. They can use our data, our reasoning. If they conclude that Apple should have recorded its sales in those countries instead of Ireland, they could require Apple to pay more tax in that country, that be nationally. That would reduce the amount to be paid back uh, to Ireland. The amount to be paid back to Ireland would also be reduced if the two companies were required to pay larger amounts of money to their US parent company to fund research and development efforts in addition to the annual payments they already have made. As I mentioned, these are conducted by the US parent on behalf of Apple Sales International and Apple Operations Europe. Finally, I do hope that it is obvious that there are many good and transparent ways for EU countries to support and encourage investment. And many, many good reasons to invest in Europe. For one, we have a single market with more than 500 million potential customers. Today's decision show that we can act when a member state gives illegal state aid to a company. It's a good thing, since illegal statement harms competition. It's unfair. Looking ahead, the ultimate goal should, of course, be that all companies, big or small, pay taxes where they generate their profits. Enforcement of EU state aid rules cannot do this alone. That is why we need changes both in corporate philosophies and we need changes in legislation to address loopholes and to ensure transparency. On the international level, both G20 and the OECD have taken important steps to reach this objective. Also in the EU, under the responsibility of my colleagues, Valdis Dombrovski and Pierre Moscovici, significant changes have been made. It has been new legislation, proposed, decided, and now under implementation. 
with more to come. This is real change, and it is change for the better. The Commission still have two in-depth state aid investigations underway into the tax treatment of Amazon and McDonald's in Luxembourg. And we are continuing our work on reviewing more than a thousand tax rulings from all EU countries that make use of them. So, we still have some work ahead of us to ensure that companies compete on equal terms and not on the expense of EU taxpayers, that be other companies or citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Let's open now a round of questions. Let's start with Suzanne uh, Lynch. Good, good afternoon, Commissioner. Uh, Suzanne Lynch from the Irish Times. Uh, two questions, please, um, quite political questions. Um, firstly, Obviously, EU competition law has long been a hugely powerful part of the European Union. Um, but with this decision and, and this uh, move towards corporate tax uh, arrangements, there's undoubtedly a shift in emphasis. Do you think that is appropriate that state aid tools are being used um, to change and uh, to have an impact on corporate tax choices by member states? And secondly, are you concerned about the impact of this on foreign direct investment into, into Ireland, but also into Europe, and whether the scale of this penalty uh, is going uh, to, to scare a lot of particularly US companies about investing into Europe? Well, to take the last, uh, the last point, point uh, first, uh, this is not a penalty. Uh, this is unpaid taxes to be paid. And I think that is very, very important. It is not a penalty, it's unpaid taxes to be paid. Second, uh, when I see the work done uh, by, for instance, my colleague um, uh, Katainen on investment in Europe, the work done by former Commissioner Hill on capital market union, uh, when I see the work done to make the single market work better by my colleague Bienkowska, I see reasons to invest in Europe piling up very good, strong, substantial reason. Adding on that, also what member states are doing to make sure that national infrastructure uh, skills of the citizens are attractive for businesses. I think the substantial reasons to invest in Europe, they're there and they are unquestioned. We're working on it, they're improving. Uh, I think it is very important uh, that we use uh, state aid rules when we find that there is state aid uh, that is not compatible with our treaty. And the Commission have been doing this since 1958. And the Court have said very clearly to us, state aid is state aid, no matter if it comes in forms of a free piece of land, a grant, uh, a very uh, beneficial loan, or a tax benefit. And the tax issues actually also have quite a history. Uh, Mario Monti, uh, predecessor a long time ago of mine, uh, was one of, uh, of, uh, of the important commissioners to put a very, very strong emphasis on this. Uh, as early as the beginning of the year 2000, we had the Belgium um, coordination centers. So you find a number of decisions who has been working with state aid in the form of taxation. Uh, it has a long history, and therefore we also have a case practice uh, to make sure that we get it right. Yes, James now. James Cantor. Thank you, uh, thank you. Uh, James Cantor, New York Times. Um, Ireland's arguments seem to boil down to the idea that it's just a proxy for a mismatch in tax laws that sort of stem from problems in the US tax code. It's one of the main reasons it says that this is an unjustified decision. Um, I wonder, just taking the Irish complaint seriously, whether it would make more sense for Brussels to be asking the United States to do something with its tax code to make those modifications um, rather than risk um, uh, damaging Ireland's model of attractiveness, especially after it's gone through such a tough time over recent years. Thank you. 
Well, the thing is that this has to do with uh, profits uh, generated in Europe and recorded in Europe. Uh, this is uh, sort of European activities, so it has to do with European taxation, uh, in case Irish taxation, and it has to do with European state aid rules, since it is taking place within the single market. Whatever the issue uh, that Apple may have with the U.S. tax code is not an issue for us. It is strictly a U.S. matter uh, and not for us, at least not for me, to advise on or discuss because this is a European matter. And I think that is very, very important to keep that in mind. And as I said uh, numerous times, uh, we're not questioning how Apple themselves set up their organizational structure. That is for them to decide. And we're not questioning, uh, because we have no right to do that under state aid rules, how they record the sales. Uh, that is also for national authorities if they want to look further into that. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Catherine Pure, EU reporter. Uh, the U.S. Treasury published a white paper recently, I'm sure you're aware of it, and it's in that paper they said that uh, decisions could damage inward investment, uh, that there may be retaliatory pressures against European companies, and that contrary to what you've just said, it will also damage the BEPS process and the OECD's uh, progress in the area, area of uh, transfer pricing. Uh, so that's, what is your response to that? And uh, also, what do you think of Ireland wanting to challenge this decision, especially at a time when there is desperate need of public investment? Thank you. Well, it is, it is obvious for 100% up to the Irish to decide whether they want to challenge the decision or not. They are in their very good right to do so if they want to do that. Uh, second, this decision is not about transfer pricing. This is about allocation of profits within the company. And uh, therefore, it is somewhat different from uh, the decisions that we took on Starbucks and the Fiat case. And uh, what we see here is, is a very concrete case, and what I feel very strongly is that we share with the US a very strong emphasis for the OECD and for the G20 to move forward because fair taxation is a global issue. It is for everyone. So there may be issues on concrete cases where we have a different point of view, but in general, I feel very strongly that we share the approach uh, with the US of fair global taxation for the benefit of the citizens of all countries. Yes, go ahead. Yes, yes. Jeremy Fleming Jones from PAR. Uh, Commissioner, you say that the unpaid taxes to be recovered by Ireland could be reduced if the US authorities were to require Apple to pay larger amounts of money. Does that mean that the whole 13 billion could be reduced by that amount if the, Irish, if the US authorities made such a demand? And is there a time bar on when that demand could be made? So if the US authorities were to demand the money in say 10 years time, would that money be taken from the escrow account then? Well, the, the details on that can be quite difficult to assess because this is obviously up to the, the US uh, tax authorities. Uh, the thing in question is, of course, the payments, the cost-sharing agreement between Apple Sales International and Apple uh, Operations Europe and the parent company uh, in the US. Uh, they are paid, and in some years, a sum of $2 billion uh, for the development uh, of, uh, of the brand, of the IP, and that cost-sharing arrangement can, of course, be questioned. If this cost-sharing goes up, well, then there is less to be taxed uh, in a European context. But that is not for me to judge, uh, because it's their decision. Uh, if they can and if they will uh, look further into these matters. Go ahead. Tony Connolly from uh, Irish uh, Public Television. 
Uh, one of the issues that the Irish government appears so bitter about, and it's also reflected in the US Treasury Department white paper, is this idea of retroactive uh, uh, a penalty that, that is retroactive. Because they make the argument that at the time, everyone felt that they were abiding by the rules and abiding by the law, and then along comes the commission and says, we want to change all that and we're doing it retroactively. And the government and the state, uh, the treasury department say specifically that this is a fundamental breach of the principle of legal certainty, which is enshrined in the EU treaties. I mean, how do you address that complaint? Well, as a matter of, of principle, when it comes to EU rules, if you want legal certainty, then you need a commission uh, decision. That creates legal certainty. Uh, second, I think that there is a very important point here on the wording, because retroactivity would suggest that you are changing rules. No rules have been changed. Not one rule have changed. This is a question of paying unpaid taxes. That's the thing. No rules have changed, no retroactivity, just unpaid taxes to be paid. That's the important point here. And second, as you use the word, they felt. I would have the feeling if my effective tax rate would be 0.05%, falling to 0.005%, I would have felt that maybe I should have a second look at my tax bill. Go ahead. Let me uh, remind you that we have colleagues from DG Comp uh, competition here for the technical briefing, so you may like to reserve more technical questions for our colleagues. Uh, immediately after me, they will start the technical briefing. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Commissioner Matthew Newman from MLEX. Um, you've answered a lot of questions about legal certainty, retroactivity, but I was just wondering about precedent. Uh, a lot of times the Commission takes these decisions to uh, make a point. And one of the main issues in the white paper last week was uh, what is the precedent behind your decisions? Um, do you intend to uh, go after some of the 1.2 trillion uh, in unpaid taxes uh, from U.S. multinationals? Or does it, do you see this more as a, an anomaly? This is something that's very specific to Ireland, very specific to Apple, and you don't necessarily see um, dozens or hundreds of other cases around Europe. Well, as far as, as I've been told, actually uh, Ireland uh, give quite few tax rulings. It's, it's not sort of the big characteristic of, of their tax system. You see that in other member states where you have many, many more tax rulings. It's much more common. So it's difficult to give, give just one profile of taxing issues in Europe. Uh, the point is, of course, that it is for each member state to make sure that national uh, legislation and EU state aid rules are fulfilled at the same time. And that is, that is basically uh, the precedent that we want. We want member states, if they uh, think it is prudent, to have a second look. Uh, there is a takeaway from the Starbucks case, from the Fiat case, from the Belgian case on, uh, on the excessive profits uh, scheme. Uh, there is a takeaway from this. And, and the point is, it comes in different forms. Very often, uh, a tax ruling is the instrument, just as well as a tax ruling can be completely fine and fair. But Often a tax ruling is the instrument, and the result is that there is a breach between uh, national legislation and EU state aid rules. And that, of course, we would like member states to look into, because it is the responsibility of the member states to make sure that this is in order, not for us to check everything that is, for obvious reasons, uh, impossible. James. <clears throat> Thank you. James Crisp at uh, your active. Uh, two very quick questions. Um, is this just Apple? I mean, in Ireland, there are plenty of other large multinational companies which are, are headquartered. And I've, I've heard some talk that there are rules, EU rules, that say that this windfall of 13 billion 
would have to be used to pay off Ireland's national debt. Is that true? Well, I, I, don't, I don't know if this is just that. Well, that would, of course, uh, suggest that we have been through everything. And this is, as always, a concrete case where we have been doing a very thorough investigation. Uh, whatever uh, happens, uh, if there is an appeal and, and a court ruling and, and the recovered unpaid taxes uh, can be freed from the escrow account, uh, it is purely in the future, and as far as I know, it will be, of course, for the Irish government to decide. Okay. Uh, yes, please. And then at the back. Yes, these last two questions. Yes, go ahead. Behind James, I cannot see you well. But go. Yes, okay. Hi, Sarah Collins from the Irish Independent and Irish Examiner. Um, it's a quick question on uh, Ireland's tax rate. There's a feeling in Ireland uh, that the Commission and some other European countries have a problem with the 12.5% headline corporate tax rate. Although this case is not legally uh, related to that, can you just say a little bit about that? And secondly, there's also a feeling that uh, the Commission is unfairly targeting small member states that may be seen by some larger member states as tax havens and uh, you know havens of unfair tax competition. Can you rebut those uh, allegations, please? Well, first of all, to make sure that we weren't biased, uh, we have asked uh, every member state uh, about their use of tax rulings and found that some member states, they have no active use of tax ruling, if ever. And from those who have uh, tax rulings, we have asked samples of what you would call maybe a national darling or multinational companies uh, to see how tax rulings are used to, to get a, a bigger uh, perspective. Uh, and what we have seen so far is that a number of countries use tax rulings in a way that's absolutely fine, no questions to be asked, well documented, uh, reflecting what would be a market situation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and then we find something that uh, may give us concerns. Uh, so we try to be very thorough in making sure that it's not just one country uh, just as well. It's not just uh, one uh, type of company because obviously we have a strong obligation in the treaty for equal treatment. Um, second, uh, it is a, a right in the treaty for each member state to set their own level of corporate taxation. And if anyone should respect the treaty, well, it should be members of the Commission. We've been the one with the hand on the book uh, to say that this is what we defend. Uh, and as I said now a number of times, the effective tax rate of Apple is very, very, very far away from the 12.5 percent. Uh, hi, for you and Chief from Reuters. Commissioner, uh, is this the maximum bill for Apple? I mean, were there circumstances where you decided that maybe the bill should be lower than a higher figure? Uh, a second question on the McDonald and Amazon case. Could you give us an update on that? How advanced are the investigations? Thank you. On, uh, on McDonald and, and Amazon, we have uh, published the opening decisions. Uh, and we're in the process of, uh, of investigating uh, the cases. Uh, but I have, uh, as always, uh, no, uh, no timing for when we will be done uh, with those. Um, Reflecting on, on your question, I've heard a rumor that there should have been uh, two decisions to choose from as kind of a replay of the old Danish movie, The Party, <laughs> where there was a yellow speech and a green speech. That, of course, is intriguing and a very sort of fine way of relaunching that film, but there's no truth in it whatsoever. Because in a case like this, there is, there is no uh, discretion it is not for me to choose. This comes from the facts of the case. And that, I think, is a very, very important point. This case is based on an in-depth investigation. It is based on the facts. And therefore, of course, I also think and hope that if it goes to court, it will be upheld by the European courts, since it is based on the facts of the case. Thank you, Commissioner. I have the feeling that this was a memorable moment of the Juncker Commission. Uh, 
Hope to see you soon. Uh, you will allow me to accompany the commissioner, and I'll come back straight for the midday. Thank you.